Amen. Today's a glorious day. For those of us who are seniors and older, the challenge is always seeing the generations following you come up and serve the Lord. There's no greater joy, and I tell people all the time, if you're, when you're discipling people, the, the uh, fruit of your discipleship, the proof of your discipling is not based on those who you bring up under you, but those who they bring up under them. Because it's always tested in the third and fourth generations. And we see that in our nation. I remember growing up as a young child, Christianity was widely accepted. Then as I began getting older and that, I began seeing some indifference toward Christianity. Now we're beginning to see hostility toward Christianity, aren't we? In our nation and many nations. And the next thing to come will be persecution of Christianity. That's why it's so important that we build solidly into the generations. I want each of one of us to know this morning that we are special in the eyes of the Lord. He sent his son to die for each and every one of us. We are unique. Touch somebody next to you and say, I'm special. You really are. Over seven and a half billion people. And nobody is exactly like you. Nobody has your fingerprint, your eye print. Nobody has your exact DNA. And so here we are, people created in the image of God, over seven and a half billion people in the world, and no two alike. That's a miracle. That's God. That's our creator. So it's so exciting to know that we are loved by the Lord, and he cares for each and every one of us because we are created in his image. This morning is a celebration. I'm not going to take much time. I've said that before. <laughs> but I'm not going to take much time. We're excited about what God is doing. And so today we're going to be celebrating. And t one of our elders, Caleb King, our son, and not because he's our son, but because he's called of God, Amen. will be recognized today. He's already an elder, ordained as an elder but he will be recognized and set apart as one who is worthy of double honor, who will serve in the word and doctrine. Another generation is being raised up. And what we say to Caleb and all the younger generations, you have a responsibility before God. The Bible says that David served God's purpose for his generation. And that's the responsibility of each one of you. When I look around, I, I, I see our families coming up and our young families. We see Luke and many others coming forth, my grandchildren, etc. The burden and the passion to see them follow the Lord. To see every subsequent generation follow the Lord. This morning, as we talk about setting him in, I'm going to go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 as my proof text. for what we're doing this morning. And the reason for that, in the church, and when you look at churches, etc., they use many different terms for somebody who's leading the church. But if we stick to the Bible, this book right here is the only authority on God. Traditions of men, what we do, doesn't matter. This is the only authority on God right here. Amen. The Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And so that's what we follow. And in 2 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, he says this, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the labor is worthy of his hire. So as you know, Caleb, at the beginning of this year, already started serving, left his previous job, and began serving the church here. But today we want to acknowledge and set him. Acknowledge as one who will serve and labor in the word and doctrine. Also who will grow in leadership here. We believe leading the team uh, as he continues to be discipled and trained for that. The importance, the importance of leadership in the church. All of our elders, several years ago I put together an eldership notebook and full of scriptures. 
But the importance of leadership in the church for every generation cannot be understated. I want to read something I wrote in the book. Because when we look at leadership, it's not something vague or ambiguous in the scriptures. If we stick to the word of God, it's very clear as to what leadership looks like, how it's to function, how it's to, you know, operate within the church and serve God's people. So I want to read something I wrote. The responsibility of the eldership is very important to the well-being of the local church. Therefore, each elder must walk in their calling with the utmost respect for the Lord, the local church, and one another. The elders must continue to grow in the Lord. They must function as a team, working together in unity of spirit and purpose. They are to be examples to the church in manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. They must be men of the Word and God, having studied hard and rightly handling His Word. They are to be esteemed for their hard work. They must lay their lives down for the flock. A little bit of sobering up front here. Because the elders will one day stand before the throne of God. And as they're standing before the throne of God, they have to give an account for everyone in the church they served. That they might do it with joy. That's why I want to encourage us to, as it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, remember those who rule over you. Verse 17 says, obey them. And verse 24 says, greet them. So we encourage you in that this morning. I want to read just one portion of scripture and to lay out the importance of what is happening today. And uh, I know others have come up and said this is a very important day. Do we have, uh, do we have a, the microphone available? Okay, could you do, uh, 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 Deanna, you made mention of something this morning. I want her to share that. Amen. Amen. It is a historic day. Today, many of the family members are here. His nieces and nephews, brothers and sisters, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, are here today to stand with him as he's being set in and to celebrate with him. But I want to read about the importance of leadership in the church. And rather than something kind of uh, loose or whatever, I, I wanted to stick to something that's a little bit sobering because... I think as we look at the world around us, there are times where we have to be sober and diligent for the enemy seeking to devour generations. They say 34% of our generation is born again or knows the Lord, but less than 4% of the younger generations. So we have to really pray and believe for a real revival among our youth and our young people. And we trust God's going to use Caleb and believe God's going to use Caleb in that, as well as not forgetting us who are older. Can I hear an amen from the seniors? Amen. amen. We're not done. Matter of fact, I never forget. I think it was when I turned 40. I can't remember if it was 40 or 50. One of the young men said to me, well, how's it feel to be over the hill? I said, by the grace of God, young man, I'm top of the hill. And by the grace of God, I'll hold it until you get up here and do your part. <laughs> never heard another word from him. We're still running hard. And we're going to be your greatest encouragers. And we'll stand alongside with you, believing for many powerful things to happen. We believe, as it's said time and time again, that our ceiling is your floor, that you'll take it so much farther than what we've taken it. First John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And there are many false prophets and false narratives that are being uh, spoken out there in the world. Many people are buying in, even Christians are buying into false narratives. Every system of this world or kingdom of this world is a false prophet. Only God himself has the authority to speak with all authority. And so we look to him. So he warns us, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Let me tell you, I see the spirit of the Antichrist very active in this world. The Antichrist is the voice that stands against Christ. It's the voice speaking out against God. It's the voice in government speaking out against God. It's the voice in education speaking out against God. It's the voice in the marketplace speaking out against God. But God is referred to as the God of hosts or Lord of hosts or Lord Almighty, and that word means the Lord of a massive army. That's you and I. And we see generations following us in this. They are of the world, therefore they speak of, of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We love our enemies. We're not against. We're for. The thing we stand against is anything that stands against God. It's not so much mankind. It's the enemy who has blinded their minds and deceived them where they walk in the manner of life that they do. Now what we're going to do, we're going to actually acknowledge Caleb is setting in of him as a pastor worthy of a double honor and serving in the word and doctrine. Caleb's role, I mean, his gifting is that more, when you look at the eldership, it was always in the plural in, in, in the scriptures. The elders plural were set in in every church. That was the government of the church. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, Paul calls for the elders from Ephesus, and he tells them to oversee, which is the word bishop, oversee, superintend the church. And he tells them to shepherd or pastor the church. But within the church, within the eldership and that, there are different giftings, whether it's apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. One of the things we've needed here for some time is somebody who really carries that pastoral mantle. And Caleb will carry that. To see, care for, and tend the church. I'm going to ask Caleb and Amy. I'm going to ask Amy's parents, as well as my wife, she'll be coming in here in a minute, to come forward here. I'm going to ask the elders to come forward here as we lay hands on Caleb. And then Caleb's going to share with us this morning. Now, let me say this. If you have a word of prophecy, word of encouragement or whatever, share that at the end with Caleb. Uh, I have uh, given license so that, so that we can redeem the time. We don't want to lose any word, though, that God wants to speak, where Todd and, and Randy can uh, share a word over here among us as the elders. Let's see if we have everybody up here I need. And I want to say this. When God calls, he calls them together. I remember when we stood out in the garden, the marriage ceremony. From that day on, God no, no longer saw you as two, but as one. You stand in this together. I don't believe either one of you, when you got married, before you were dating or whatever, ever thought this day would be before you. God's full of surprises. Amen. Full of them. We never thought either, but God called Loma and all of these here. Here we have Amy's parents standing alongside of her, as well as Lola and the elders. At this time, Todd, do you have anything you want to? I do. Um, yeah, this is a uh, familiar scripture, maybe to many of us. Um, but I want to read this um, to you because I believe it's going to be kind of not a mantra, but it's going to be something that's going to anchor um, some of your insecurities that comes along with, you know, the office. 
But this is found in Isaiah chapter 26, and I'll read from the third verse. And it says, You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both its inclination and its character, as it stayed on you. Because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. So trust in the Lord and lean on him. Hope confidently in him forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, the rock of ages. Now, I just want to agree with the word and that we believe that this is going to be a part of your nature. It's your heart to desire the Lord above all else. But it takes practice. But I want to just say to you that this scripture, I believe, will come and uh, find a home in your heart and be brought to your remembrance, especially in times where you're saying, are you sure you did this right, God? Are you sure? But I just want to um, agree with the word and ask that God sow this into your heart so that it become part of the fabric and your makeup. So as Holy Spirit brings it back to your remembrance, you will remember that your confidence doesn't lie in yourself but into the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and it is his promise to you. Yes and amen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, Caleb, as I was standing up here, the Lord just showed me you standing before a great field, and it's like the Lord said, it's, the world is before you. And it was like there was a struggle going on. What do I do? What do I do? And as Todd has already said, the Lord said, I am faithful. And he's saying it to both of you. Amen. He was faithful with your children. You prayed, you seeked them out, and the Lord blessed you with the children. And Caleb, we all see the supernatural growth. We see the hand of God all over you, and we know this is totally of the Lord, and he is faithful, and he is going to finish the work. Amen? Justice Gilliam. Um, Brother Caleb, I have a scripture to read for you. And this is found in the book of Second uh, Chronicles, uh, chapter 1. So I'm going to start reading verse 6. And Solomon went, went up there to the house, uh, to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. On that night, God appeared in, uh, to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David, my father, and have made him king in his place. Now, O oh Lord, God, let your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before these people. For who can judge this great people of yours. And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have, uh, have had who have come before you, nor shall any other uh, after you have the like. Now, in every analogy, there's what we call the point of comparison. So, I'm not saying you're becoming a king, all right? <laughs> the point of comparison is what Solomon asked God to do for him, 
that is the point of comparison here. He asked God for wisdom, for knowledge, to guide his people. And Brother Caleb, having lived with you 11 years now, I know you very well, with your wife. And having served the Lord for decades, I have one word of wisdom for you. Do not concern yourself with anything else other than the leading of the Holy Spirit on what he wants you to do in this church. We have no idea. <clears throat> we think we know, but we don't, what God has for you for this ministry. We don't know where this ministry is going. God knows. And he knew the person he could use for that was you. As my, as my friend Ron has said, it's not because you are his son that we are setting you up, but because God has chosen you. Before my wife and I came to America, and this always brings tears to my eyes, the Lord said to me clearly, I could hear him as well as I have heard any voice speak to me. Hand over this ministry to your son. It wasn't because he was my biological child, but because God chose John Wesley to take over that ministry. And I want to tell you, Caleb, the Holy Spirit has chosen you, not because you are own son, but because he has appointed you and elected you before the foundation of the world to take this ministry. Look up. And ask him, God, why me? What do you want me to do with your children? What do you want me to do with his ministry? Every day, receive guidance from him. And the sky is the limit, my brother. Amen. Because our God is able. And he is in charge of this work. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Amy, we want to present you some flowers and... And I think we'll probably be able to get your grandparents, you know, some of us to babysit some night. You could go out and, you know, have. Okay. And I want to thank my wife also for standing with me and raising godly children. Amen. Amen. All of our children serve the Lord in one way or another, and we're proud of you all. But Roger and Linda, we want to thank you, too, for raising a daughter that would be called alongside. We know you're the head. But the net turns the head. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You want to put the microphone, please? Lou's going to pray, and then we're going to lay hands on the two of you. Father, I thank you today to have the privilege to have this beautiful lady in my life, in the life of my son. Father, I pray that in days to come, you would bless her abundantly. And, Father, that you would be with her. Father, you have called her as a helpmate, one to come alongside and encourage and strengthen her husband. Father, as they both serve you, we welcome them, Father. We thank you that you have placed them in your house, God, amongst us. So we bless them today. We honor them. And we thank you that in days to come, you will be with them in the good times, in the hard times. Yes, Lord. You will be there, God. And you will strengthen them each time, and they will become even stronger and go from glory to glory. So, Father, we thank you again today for this privilege and honor, Father, that we've gotten as a church to bless them and to welcome them as your leaders amongst us. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for my son, Caleb. We bless him also. And we thank you for him, Father, and the blessing he's been to our family. We thank you that you fulfilled the word of God in his life. As we stood and prayed, Father, that you fulfilled it. And this is a day that I say thank you, my Father, for fulfilling those things you have called him to do in your kingdom. Yes. Amen. Amen. This time, let's just stretch forth our hands over Caleb and Amy here. And I want to encourage the congregation to stretch forth your hands as a matter of affirmation for what's going on here today. Amen. Lord, we just acknowledge the calling on their lives. 
And we acknowledge the calling on Caleb to labor in the word and doctrine. We acknowledge his grace and gifting as a pastor, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you that this day he's being acknowledged, he's being recognized, he's being set in. Lord, as an elder who will labor in the word and doctrine and pastor the flock. And so we thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we say, Lord, amen. 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 And amen. 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 Glory to God. We do serve a faithful God. Uh, amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, whenever God wants to do something in our life, it's always for his glory. You know, if you look all through scriptures, everything that goes on, whether it feels good to the individual or not, to a tribe or not, to a nation or not. He said, let me encourage you something. This is for my glory. It's for my name. And so I want to share a little bit of my heart with you and a little bit about me, but I want to encourage us all. Just as I am stepping into something that God had created just for me, it's pretty awesome. But he's also got something just for you. Individually, that is just as awesome. Because he's a team player. He created team. And so, when you think about human nature and man in general, he's got many assignments for us as the body of Christ, how we represent a collective singular. We are many. Those that believe in his name, we are joined as family, but he sees us as one. And that he is at the top. And so, my heart is to serve you wholeheartedly. My heart is to represent God who never changes in generations that are constantly changing. My heart is for people to say, man, that's absolutely crazy. It makes no sense. But there's something about it that brings me peace, and I'm going to trust it anyways. Because everything we got in this world and everything we look at, we rely on it. We cling to it because we see it. But God is just the opposite. Because we know faith is something that we don't see, but we trust in anyways. And so like Justice was saying, Lord, I don't know where you're taking this thing with me, but my heart and what he put inside of me is... Don't worry about all the detail. Just start walking. And so a lot of times we're so caught up, and I might get to my message, a lot of times we're so caught up into wanting to know something and we just sit still. And God's saying, I'm not going to show you that. I'll show you what's on the other side when you step in the uncertainty. And that's what faith is all about. You know, I think about how far the Lord has brought me. Like Dad says, would I ever thought we'd be standing up here? Absolutely not. I mean, the things I've done growing up, the car accident I was in, the friend I lost, why he spared me, almost dying in a coke plant with a thousand pound press on my head for three minutes. 
had a plan for me. But I ran so long because what I found out was is that my plan for my life wasn't exactly his plan when I found out his plan. And it scared me. And so I would, I would start walking the other way. But he would always use somebody. Let me tell you, God will always use somebody to speak to you. If you, if you are honestly looking to, to avoid God and, and he's got plans for you, he will go around your thought process and use somebody to speak in your life. And that's one of the responsibilities as we serve one another. Because we all fall in traps, ruts, disappointments, and hardships. And the enemy wants to separate us and divide us. But we have to say, no, that is not of God. And sometimes they're not pleasant to hear, but sometimes we have to be offended up in the brain so the heart can be revealed and pour ourselves out to Jesus Christ. That's just the reality. And so my heart, like all of us, I'm telling you, God just, he, Jesus came to serve. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. He simply came to serve. And you look at how we measure as, as human nature, how we measure success, how we measure greatness. Greatness, it always comes through this, this, this big appearance. Right? This thing that takes up space. It's like, it's just mega. It's big. We consider those things great. But God operates a little differently when it comes to greatness. You know, if you even take, uh, what do we have, a Super Bowl tonight? Okay? Take athletes, for example. Growing up, I mean, in high school, you can be absolutely the best thing since sliced bread in high school, and you get up to college and the pros, and you're just another Joe. Just another Joe. The ones that are great, because in the pros, they're not all great. There's only some that are great and some that make really good, significant money. They all make okay money, but not compared to some that make millions and millions of dollars money. But what I'm saying is this, the ones that are great, there's just something inside of them. It's a gift. But not only the gift, because they don't just stop there. They're also one of the hardest workers, the ones that are great. They're the ones that study the film nonstop. They're the ones with their heads are constantly in the playbook. They're the ones that are first one to practice and the last ones to leave. They set the example. They're disciplined learners in their craft. Those are the great ones. I'm telling you today that all of you, when you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, every one of you has greatness in you. But on top of that, his desire is for you to study nonstop. I remember Kobe Bryant said something one day, and it really separated. I never thought about this, but it's so true. Because he's a champion. He, he's a great one in the NBA. And it, I don't know if verbatim, but he says, you know what's better or when I can't, well, how did he say it? It was about winning. He says, what means more to me than winning? He says, I hate losing. It wasn't about the victory or the W he was going to have in the day. It was the fact that he put all the time in. He put all his gift and talents in. He put everything he had into it, and he lost. It frustrated. But we do, we measure success a little differently when it comes to greatness because Jesus 
and the disciples, you know, he gathered up about 12 of them. Not about, he gathered 12. And there he is, Jesus, with his disciples, constantly training them up and constantly discipling them, constantly saying, this is the way I'm showing you the way. And then he would find them grumbling amongst each other. Because all he talked about was his kingdom coming. The kingdom is near. Change the way you think. But see, sometimes when we have ideas, just like the disciples, they envision something. Because they were envisioning what they were already seeing in the physical. And they were seeing the Roman Empire constantly ruling over a nation. They saw how they operated in their kingdom. And so here comes Jesus saying, something new is coming. And so what they kept on doing was, okay, Jesus is coming back to restore the throne of David. This is going to be a great kingdom on earth. This is going to be amazing. And so they were talking about, well, who's going to be the greatest? Because we're all disciplined learners. We're all studying. We're all getting in there. We're all doing the thing with Jesus. And so they, they would grumble, who's going to be the greatest? And so he was like, what are you guys talking about over there? He says, listen, and he'd take a child. He wouldn't look for a child. He says, those who are children like this will be the greatest in the kingdom. And now you think about that. If you look at Matthew chapter 18, where they had this discussion again, James and John wanted to actually sit at the right hand and left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. Their mama came and said, will you do this for my boys? I'm a mama's boy. I know what that's all about. I'm the youngest. He says, listen, that's not my business. That's the father's business. And so it got the other disciples were all ramped up. And he had to get them together and said, listen. And he pulls a child again. He says, unless you change and become like one of these, you will never even see the kingdom of God. He's talking to his disciples. Because they were measuring greatness according to what they have seen, and not according to what God designed. The kingdom of God is within us. It is a spiritual kingdom that changes lives and breaks down barriers and destroys buildings. That's what we do as believers. We carry a kingdom that will never be shaken. And when everything else is shaken, we will stand firm and people will come running to us saying, why you? And I'll say, because of him. Because of him. He says, you change and become like one of these children. The thing is, the change, he's talking about you got to twist your thinking. John Jones, you come up for a second. My brother-in-law. Come on, man. Don't be shy. Get up here. Hearing all that. Looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Love my man. My brother-in-law right here. Give him a round of applause. Look at him. That's my family. I just want to give you an illustration. Now, don't hurt me. <laughs> Jesus is talking about you need to twist your thinking. Now, when we were kids, I was the youngest of five. So my brothers, I didn't want to use Eddie because he'd probably do it for real. <laughs> Going back in the day. If John were to grab my arm and he twists my arm, you know you twist your arm? And even saying, you know, you twist my arm. And so I give in, right? Until I say, Uncle, John, you're playing God right now, so be careful. <laughs> This is how people sometimes see God. As this hardcore coming down on you, let me twist you until this, that is not God. 
What brings me to my knees? Now, John, place your hand on my head and on my back like it's my heart. You know God does more behind your back than he does in your face. And so I can't see what God is doing, but I feel, I sense him. He's not in my face. I can't, I'm, I'm believing. But when his hands get to my head, my thinking, and my heart, my knees drop to the ground and I surrender. Thank you, John. Good job playing God, John. <laughs> well, see, that's the God that we serve. And so he says, you have to twist. I'm not going to twist your arm for you. You've got to twist it yourself. You've got to twist your brain and your heart. You've got to change. You might as well call it repent. Because without it, you can't enter. Jesus' requirements, man, they are stellar. But they are worth every step that we take. And the thing about a child is, children, they don't come with naturally growing up with self-ambition. They don't come up, my son doesn't have any ambition to do anything right now, but just to hang out and be on his tablet, watch some videos, eat some food, go to school, hug his friends. He's got no ambition to do something that's going to possibly separate him from God. Now, I'm not saying ambition is wrong, but when ambition to be you overrides the ambition to be with him, it's wrong. My son isn't prideful. It's not in him at that age. He's not arrogant. He's too young to be arrogant. He doesn't know any better. God saw the heart of a child and said, I need to grab this one right here because all of you aren't getting it. I'm not saying you guys, disciples. <laughs> and he says, look at this child. And you know the thing about children and why it's so important when they're young? Because they're teachable. And they're pliable. We get to shape them. If not, the world will shape them. So my heart is to shape him to be hungry for God. And then when he gets to the age where pride wants to kick in, he has a decision to make. And so does my daughter. She's going to be perfect till she's 95. <laughs> We're going to end with a song of worship here, but I just want to share something where Jesus said, I believe it's in Luke chapter 10, way late down in the game, about 46 or something like that. He's talking about the situation. And he says, for the Son of Man did not come to, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Three things he did that he's even calling us to do. First one, come. Scripture says he came. He was obedient to the call. He knew his fate. He knew his cup. He came. He served. And he served to the point where he gave his life. That's what Jesus wants for us. He's calling us to come. He's calling us to serve him. But we have to die for him. You see, it's easy to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior because he died for you and I. But to accept him as, as your Lord, which means ruler, that means we have to die for him. And like I say this all the time, life is not rainbows, skittles, and lollipops when you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But everything we do and everything we carry is all about the hope, the message of hope. God will get you through. 
if you can continue to persist and stand in faith and walk in his ways. And so my oath to Westside is to serve you wholeheartedly. To succeed with you, to fail with you. To laugh with you and to cry with you. To see children raise up and to bury each other. That's what family's all about. I want to say thank you on behalf of my wife and I and our family. We love you. We appreciate you. And we always will. Amen, church? Amen.